Vagachuk Khalsa, Vagachuk Fote Singachi. Today I am in Tetford. Um, we're outside the Guild Hall where um, they're about to celebrate the 125th year um, anniversary of the death of Maharaja Dalip Singh. There's so many things happening over the next couple of weeks, so the Sikh Channel have been invited to, um, to this festival. So let's go in and take a look around. Pearl, uncut rubies, topaz stones. These are all different type of trappings which is accumulated under Maharaja Ranjit Singh as the wealth of the Punjab nation increases. But um, that was just like a kind of, a kind of diagram of what she'd actually noted at that particular time. So whilst I mentioned earlier about a single treasury, I'm now gonna backtrack a little bit. <laughs> it was a number of treasuries which were kind of kept by Maharaja Ranjit Singh. The first one is referred to as the Toshokana and is referred to as the main treasury of the Sikhs. The second one was in Gobindgar Fort, which is in Amritsar, and was mainly more monetary, so that's where the wealth and the money was kept as opposed to relics as such. And the third one was actually at the Golden Temple or the Har Harmanda Sahib, which we call it. And that treasury was actually very, very special, but I'll but was very, very interesting because when the British um, and the East India Company, um, you know, had the annex, uh, undertook the annexation of the Punjab, they didn't actually touch the treasury at Harmanza Saab. So all the wealth which was kept there still exists even to this day, something that a lot of people don't know. They only show those items on special occasion. It's just something which I thought would be useful uh, to actually discuss. Okay, so... What we're talking about next, Ranjit Singh passes away in 1839. The Lahore court or Darbar is in a little bit of a chaos state. What happens is the British are looking inwards and thinking, hold on a second, we've actually kind of annexed a lot of territories across India and Pakistan at that time. And, uh, you know, the Sikhs are a great prize. Noticing that there's dissension amongst the Sikhs, they actually undertake a number of things. They actually increase their military personnel all around the Punjab. They actually start sending a number of boats around the Punjab area. So it's almost like they're kind of surrounding the Punjab without actually kind of physically saying we're on a war footing. At the same time, the Lahore Darbar or court is also vying for kind of like having a battle with the Sikhs as well. So it gets the crux where we actually start or we, that develops into what we call the Anglo-Sikh Wars. So let's just put this in context. This is the Sikh empire composed of Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims against the East India Company, okay? So remember, it was the East India Company which had originally gone out into various places to actually, you know, for trade purposes. And then as the trade increased, they started actually having a number of kind of military units around them. And then in the end, the Queen's uh, army personnel also joined them in India as well as their kind of territories increased. So it was a Sikh empire against the East India Company. Two battles, in a sense, 1845 to 1846, then 1848 to 1849. What happens at the end of the first Anglo-Sikh war is the son of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, Dalip Singh, is just a young child at that time. The Queen Regent at the time, Maharani Jindan Kaur, is, you know, she's the Queen Regent and that's, he's just the ward of, of, of the Lahore Darbar. Si getting away to sign away territories which we and the Sikhs always consider as being like a kind of malicious act by the British, kind of getting a youngster who didn't know what he was signing to sign away the kind of hold the territories of the Punjab. <laughs> But that demonstrates um, the Leap Singh submission to Henry Hardinge, who was the Governor General at that particular time. So what happens next then? After the annexation of the Punjab, the British initiated a treaty with the Lahore government dated 29th of March 1849. The treaty asked for the core cost of the war to be paid by the Sikhs. As much of the money was spent by the Lahore Darbar, they actually um, made the Sikhs actually pay for it in other ways. One of these ways was um, Galab Singh was actually 
kind of afraid from the Anglo-Sikh wars, but he was willing to actually, you know, do a deal with the British and actually was able to buy the territories of Kashmir for a certain amount of money. The other thing was to administer the relics and artifacts and for the British to actually kind of seize upon the treasury which I talked about, which was at Gobindgar Fort as opposed to the treasury which I'm going to discuss now. So what happens is administrators are sent in to actually kind of measure the amount of wealth which is kept in the Lahore Doshokana, so to speak. John Logan here, he's given the task of actually kind of uh, making records of it. And on 6th of April, he's installed in the, within the citadel and he actually goes and looks at the jewels, the valuables, including the Kuhinur, and actually starts realizing that there's a, a significant amount of wealth within the actual treasury itself. So he gets familiar with this treasury, and then what he does do is he actually starts creating a kind of list in terms of, now it's really strange actually, because you'd think the list is actually all for the British. It wasn't. They, they were making the list so they could actually sell off part of the treasury. For them, they only wanted the best items. And this is actually noted by Lord Dalhousie because the Governor General changed during the course of those years. And what Lord Dalhousie is now actually saying, he's making regular visits to this treasury to see what's the cream of the treasury, what's the bits that they can get for them, either for himself or for Queen Victoria as well. So what's noted is that um, a statement is actually said that besides the jewels he was allowed to pick out for the little Maharaja, he also was careful that um, he was able to select the best items from the treasury and, uh, you know, um, he actually took a lot of things for himself. So this was Lord Dalhousie actually ensuring that he had the best items out of this for himself. So, the inventory was composed of numerous items and this includes Sikh manuscripts, the armory had many shields and swords, the jewels we talked about, exquisite Kashmiri shawls, other objects, including the chair of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, which I'll allude to later on. So, as you can see, the treasury is very, very rich in terms of what it was composed of. So, what happens next is there is a number of sales. And what we find is that many of these items are actually sold. And some of these items are never, ever to be seen again. Even now, if we were to say, well, where are these items? No one knows where they actually went to. And that's how we don't really have a full picture of what took place when the sales were initiated. So it does pose a number of questions in terms of what happens next and where these items went to. But um, after getting straight approval, um, the Secretary of State, uh, the following relics were, some of these relics were actually shipped to England after getting them heavily insured. And some of them included, now I've written the words as they were written by the British, but essentially, um, included swords, again, iron weapons. There was like a galgi, but made out of glass. There were like barsha, which was like spears, and the Ranjit Singh's golden chair as, as well. Now, it's important to actually say this is not the only items, but I'm just kind of making this list known because this is what the kind of listing items were actually noted by uh, Logan at that particular time as well. So it's like a small element of the actual treasury, in a sense. Uh, I'm going to skip over the Kuri New Diamond, actually, believe it or not. And um, I'm going to actually talk about, um, so those relics, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, um, some of them were very, really, really precious. And on top of that, some of these items and other items were related to Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th leader of the Sikhs. So, you know, sometimes people actually say, well, can we have the Kohinoor diamond back? India talks about it, Pakistan talks about it. But interestingly, in 1965, some of the actual weapons of Guru Gobind Singh were given back to the Indian government. And there was great fanfare in, in 1965. These relics were actually passed to the prime minister. And essentially, they were now, well, they're now kept in one of the um, that's what we call one of the royal thrones at Keshkar Saab in Anandpur. So these weapons were actually returned and they do actually have a special place in the, sanct in the sanct sanctorum at Anandpur. So it does happen, items can get <laughs> sent back to uh, Punjab. Whether items will do in the future, maybe that's one of the questions that can be asked later on. Okay, so before I touch upon the different kind of relics that uh, kind of reside here in the UK, I just wanted to actually talk a little bit about 
in terms of what we've been doing as an organisation of actually tracking down these seat relics. And for us, it's not just museums which hold the seat relics, it's libraries, it's universities, it's military locations, regimental locations, the Royal Collection, for instance, private collections where there is a numerous or a plethora of artefacts which are kept amongst people's own wealth or within the treasuries as well. Because what you've got to remember is, whilst the British themselves brought back items, army personnel brought items back themselves as well. So we have instances during the anglo sikh Wars where army personnel are actually literally picking off items off the Dead Sikhs and taking it with them. It worked the other way around as well, for obvious reasons. So I'm going to move on to a number of items just to give you a kind of snapshot of kind of different seat relics and artifacts which uh, are around in the UK. Now, for me personally, if I look and if I was to map out all of the UK, I can categorically say I can stand anywhere in the UK and within a couple of miles, there'll be some kind of relationship with the Sikhs and the Punjab. It's everywhere across the UK. You can go on holiday, just, you know, just be lying there and all of a sudden, you know, they'll see a seat with a turban and, you know, they'll get a gentleman and say, oh, by the way, did you know there's something just around the corner? It literally is like that in the UK. You could be travelling in five, ten miles in that particular direction and you will find that there is some kind of connection. That's how rich this kind of symbosis, in a sense, between the British and the Sikhs has been over these many years. So what we did last year was um, we actually visited a number of regimental museums which actually took part in the uh, anglo sikh Wars. And the reason for us actually visiting the um, regimental museums was is that um, they were very smaller in size. Secondly, not many Sikhs had actually visited them in terms of actually kind of knowing what Sikh relics and artifacts were there. So our organisation was probably one of the first to actually go and have some dialogues with these individuals and organisations as well. So I'm going to go through a number of items which we actually kind of used for our exhibition last year. So in terms of this particular Bible, this belonged to Colonel Brooks and it was part of the 24th Regiment of Foot. And it was from the actual Royal Welsh um, regimental museum which we actually obtained. Now what the significance of items like this is, whilst it's a Bible and you may have no kind of, kind of relationship with the Sikhs, in the text itself there is actual descriptions of the Battle of Chilliamwala, which was um, one of the battles in the second Anglo-Sikh war, for instance. So we were able to glean uh, some in information about the war just from this particular Bible itself. Also from the Regimental Museum of the Royal Welsh, uh, we also noticed that um, there were other items there as well. And for us, it's all about actually exploration. And in terms of what museums hold, not just in the front, but also in the back as well. And whilst we were doing some research there, um, the curator goes to me and says, um, we've got a couple of rings. And we thought he was going to bring out some rings that you put on your hand, for instance. And he came out and brought these quoits for us to look at. And so in Sikh uh, theology, Sikh history, however you want to call it, the Sikhs actually used to wear these chakrams or quotes within their turbans. Now, a group of Sikhs, what we call the Agali Nihangs, would actually, and still do to this very day, actually wear them on their attire. And they'd be actually used literally as a spinning vehicle and actually used within battle. And there's evidence and anecdotes of that taking place within the Anglo-Sikh wars as well. Um, so that's why I've just opposed it with a depiction with one of the quotes. Now, interestingly, as you may probably be aware, is that the Sikhs wear the turban. And um, during the Anglo-Sikh wars, it was no difference. However, a certain military unit of the Sikhs, known as the Gojaras, which was the cavalry force of the Sikhs, they actually did wear helmets as well. So for some of them, they needed a different kind of headpiece as well. So they actually used to wear these cloths on top of their helmets and then have these kind of feathers protruding from them as well. So on the right-hand side, we have Sheer Singh Adariwala, who was one of the generals which fought in the Second anglo sikh Wars. And what we found was on our kind of our visits, one of these headpieces, which was actually found in the uh, Regimental Museum in Nottinghamshire. So we were, you know, we were actually very, very surprised to actually see these kind of objects. This was actually on display itself. Now, Maharaja Ranjit Singh had kind of uh, militarised his army on European lines as well. So there was a number of generals who actually 
fought alongside or trained the Sikh army from France, Italy, and many other locations as well. So what you can see on the left-hand side is a shell jacket from the Shropshire Regimental Museum. But interestingly, when we visited Worcestershire, we were able to actually find a Sikh coatee, which is very, very unusual. There's probably, as far as we know, we've never seen any Sikh coatees, anything like this anywhere in the world, let alone you know, in the UK. But interestingly, this Sikh coatee, which is braided and it's got a very, very elaborate design, isn't for an adult. It's actually for a child, which makes the story even more bizarre in terms of who this actually belonged to. The museum were unable to actually kind of find out who it belonged to. We were unable to locate. It could be a child of one of the chiefs, for instance, because it had to be someone really of, someone of, of repute, so to speak. OK, so the Sikh scriptures. I thought it might be like a, it'd be worth actually talking about the number of Sikh manuscripts which are held in collections all across the UK as well. Um, the British Library hosts a number of Sikh manuscripts, the Guru Granth Sahib, which is the Guru of the Sikhs, the Dasam Granth, the secondary scripture of the Sikhs, Janam Sakis, which are the birth stories of Guru Nanak, and many, many other kind of Punjabi and Sikh texts as well. That's not, again, just at the British Library, but all across the UK as well. And, uh, you know, it's really, really interesting to note how many of these do actually exist in the UK. But why am I uh, giving special prominence to this particular manuscript? Well, it actually belonged to Maharani Jindan Kaur. So it belonged to the mother of uh, Dalip Singh. And it was a personal manuscript which she kept and for, for prayer and recital. And uh, this is actually kept, like I said, in the British Library. And it, one of the actual verses in there, or one of the actual scripts which is used there, is the Sukhmani Saab, which is one of these very, very special um, verses in the Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib. And there is a, um, a depiction of Rani Jindan Kaur on the right hand side as well. Okay, so Thetford. I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about the actual portrait which the Singh twins have actually unveiled here today in, uh, in Ancient Houses Museum. Now, it's actually a very, very elaborate design and actually discusses the history of Dalip Singh. I'm not going to talk too much about it because it's there for everyone to see and kind of make their own minds as to what the picture represents. But in terms of Thetford, it's really, really important to actually understand that Dalip Singh lived here in Thetford. He's buried here as well. So therefore, the community of Thetford remembers him in a fond way, even though he lived in places like Perthshire in Scotland as well. So it's with Scotland that I really want to just talk about a number of items, actually. So within the actual portrait by the Singh twins, there is a number of Sikh relics which have been actually um, portrayed as well. So we have, and I'll talk about this in a second, we have the items which I've not shown here. We have the golden chair of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. We have this kind of star which Maharaja Ranjit Singh would give to his generals as well. And there's other items which kind of give this kind of backdrop as to what the Lee Singh's life is about. But back to these three particular relics I want to talk about. So what we have is an old pendant which is inlaid okay, in gold or in these, and that can actually be demonstrated there. So that depicts a Hindu goddess actually, which is a Devi, and is from the region of about 18 to 1850. And this is so all these items are in the National Museum of Scotland, which have some of these which I've actually seen for myself. We have an enameled bottle, which can be seen on the left side of the portrait. And we also have a detailed gold pen case as well, produced in Northern India during the 19th century as well. So this actual depiction by St. Twins is very, very kind of peculiar in the sense that it, it does actually talk about real events, does talk about real relics. And these actual relics were actually kept by Prince Victor Dalip Singh, the Maharaja's eldest son. And then he did actually sell them off in the open market. And then I think it was Major Carnegie, who was a collector of coins, and he was able to actually buy these from the auction house, Spinks. And um, he then able, he, was, he kept them in his own collection, for instance. And then upon his death in 1911, they were given to the National Museum of Scotland. So in a sense, this is a kind of nutshell in terms of the different types of seat relics which exist all across the UK. And I mean, I could go on for hours talking about different locations, 
you know, even in Leicestershire, where I'm from, there's a cannon from the Anglo Sikh Wars down the road from me. The Derbyshire Museum has a number of cannons. It's endless. But we have to have, find some way of actually making sense of these items. And that's what our organization is trying to do. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually pass over to my colleague, Taranjit Singh, who's going to talk about what our organization does and what we can do to actually make sense of some of these items in terms of what we can do in terms of preservation as well as actually protecting items that really do need preserving for the future. We will come back for some, I'll come back for some questions, but I'll hand you over to Taranjit Singh. Thank you. Okay, Vaigurji ka Khalsa, Vaigurji ki Fateh. So, uh, as you can see there, um, uh, we've covered uh, like some of the relics that uh, Gorinda has been like locating around the UK. And uh, so, I'm going to come in with uh, what my perspective is on this. So, I am a, a 3D interactive designer. Uh, I work in the um, architectural visualization industry. Uh, I work in uh, computer aided design, and I basically create. Uh, architectural visualizations of uh, buildings. So I'm going to show you an example of that. We can we started to look at these objects and say they're worn and torn. How can we get that detail in there? So here you can see a shield where gradually uh, the detail is being added, damage is being added, and we've gotten as far as we can even put uh, so much detail into the objects that we can even do uh, the stitching on the cloth. We can do the texture of the cloth. We can there you can see on the handles on the leather we can do the stitching on the cloth as well. Going back to the materials. How do we make these things look realistic? So we look at real world materials. How do metals react? How do cloth react? How does silk react to light? So we've kind of done all these studies and we look at real world examples. So they are, these are real world values of uh, physical materials. So there you can see different examples of these materials. What we also look at, how do these uh, materials react under different uh, light conditions. So there you can see a day to light transition and how the material changes and reacts here. So what we found is we could create uh, different types of maps and textures and then be able to really show some realistic uh, 3D objects. So they actually look real as well. So they're not, they're not cartoony or, or gamey. We use HDR lighting techniques. So we use photography to light the objects. So what happens is we get kind of objects which react to light, uh, have real world material values and look very realistic. So look exactly like the original thing. So what we want to do is we want you to have an authentic experience of it being in front of you. And you don't get that if it doesn't look realistic or you, know, you don't feel as if it's real. So we look at metals, uh, uh, metal objects, uh, metal values. So the next thing we looked at was 3D printing. So we got these 3D assets. So we made a 3D asset. How many different ways can we use it? So we've been looking at 3D printing. Once we've got a 3D asset, we took it into our exhibition uh, last year, and we got some kids in there, and we showed them, and they absolutely loved the 3D printing. And we were able to 3D print objects which they normally wouldn't be able to hold because the objects are valuable. So we're showing some examples. So you've seen the Hermanda Saib uh, uh, dome. So we've got the photographs. We made a 3D model of it. And then we were able to 3D print it. And the kids can hold that in their hands, and it's not an expensive item. Um, this is a uh, Grinder, and uh, just more uh, uh, one of our volunteers went out to Victoria and Albert Museum and looked at these uh, arrows from Lahore during the uh, 18th century. And within him coming back and showing us the photos, within like a day, we had already created a 3D model and we had 3D prints, which you can see over here. Now, thank you. These are things, yeah, like you wouldn't be able to give an original object to a child, but because this is not sharp. You know, we can give that to a child and say, oh, look, you can have a look, look at the workmanship of it, look at the shapes of it, and get them to start drawing it, or even get them to paint one of these in. You know, we could give them one to take home with them. So we've been looking at um, kind of uniforms. So this is a, like a, a First World War soldier uh, from Saragari time period. So we can actually do very, very realistic depictions. Uh, we're also looking at different headdresses, different types of turbans that were worn, and having 3D models of those. We're even looking at accurate depictions of uh, how the Sikhs, you know, when the British went into battle, what kind of soldiers would they have faced? So we've been, we've been like recreating some of those soldiers from the uh, um, 18th century. So th when the British came over, these are the type of warriors that they would have been fighting against. And if you listen to some of the quotes uh, of, uh, you know, some of the kind of very scary stories of the, the British facing some of these warriors, 
We've been looking at artifacts such as, uh, you know, some of the workmanship on there. So we've started to look at uh, pattern detail. And uh, the actual string on this bow uh, is uh, from uh, the Leeds Armoury. So they've got a really good example of how they used to um, plait the, 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 the silk string to make the bow for, the, for their arrows. And again, there's a, um, a quiver with all the pattern work on it. So we can get really, really detailed. And we've even gone as far as to kind of start to kind of uh, look at how can we depict people from that time? How can we bring them back to life? How can we let kids kind of uh, experience, uh, you know, what kind of situation they were in? So we're looking at recreating some of these. And we've got a 3D print of that female warrior um, over here. So you can see those as well. OK. So what we started to do is we started to look at um, real-time engines. How can we use, um, how can we use real-time engines? I'm just going to go back here. So how can we use real-time engines to kind of um, display these objects? So this is on at the uh, Ancient Houses Museum at the moment. So you can have a go on this. You can you know, view these objects. You can kind of spin them around and see them. So here you'll see uh, me interacting with these objects. So this is the closest uh, thing that you can get to actually having the object in front of you. But we haven't stolen any objects. We haven't taken anything from anywhere. We haven't uh, you know, had to buy any objects. So it's a very kind of viable way of us preserving our heritage and sharing it with the next generation. So this is another way that we thought, how can we put it in the kids' hands? How can we get them to hold these objects and play with them? So these are my kids uh, playing around with 3D objects. They're looking at a screen, augmented reality. Uh, it's been around for a couple of years, been used a lot. But uh, I think museums aren't using it you know, to its full advantage. So they, they, they love playing around with that. They're able to hold the object, have a look at it. And they're more likely to think about the, the, the actual design and shape of it as well. So it's kind of like a fun thing to have. The next thing we're looking at is uh, virtual reality. So we're looking at things that uh, people can use to kind of uh, look at objects in virtual reality. So we're going to show you um, a couple of examples of that. You've also got things like Google Cardboard, which is made by Google. You can put your mobile phone in there and view 3D objects. We've got online platforms where we can now share 3D objects online. And uh, so the conclusion is, uh, so recent advancements in technology mean, you know, we really, this, this technology is out there now. Kids are using it on their mobile phones. We've got a great opportunity to kind of uh, use this technology to, you know, preserve, bring back to life uh, heritage that's been lost. And uh, we think that it's going to have a critical role to play uh, in the future. And uh, finish off with the new project that we're doing uh, over the next two years. We're going to be digitizing a load of uh, 3D objects, very rare 3D objects, and putting them online so people can share them. So if you think about it, we've taken a 3D model. We can share it on a screen. We can share it on a mobile phone. We can share it in augmented reality, virtual reality. We can also 3D print it as well. So that's the whole idea of our project. Vai Gurji ka khalsa. Vai Gurji ki fateh.